<laughs> um, yeah, I'm Cassandra Harper, and I'm here with Shana Rusty. Uh, we are recent graduates from the Masters in Ecological Restoration Program, and uh, I think we're both very happy to be here and want to thank you for having us. Uh, you just blew my, my introduction out of the water with my land acknowledgement as well. Yours was much better than mine, but um, I did have this here because that is one of the most important things that we learn in the program. Um, and one of the first things that we learn is to always do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of any presentation. Um, so I'm in Burnaby, so I'm acknowledging that this talk is occurring on unceded Coast Salish territory, the traditional territories of the Coquitlam, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Kwantlen nations. So just as a basic overview of my portion of the talk, um, I'll first go into some detail about the master's program in ecological restoration, a general overview of the course and some of our favorite things about it. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, what exactly ecological restoration is, uh, some of the concepts that we learn and how it's applied. And then after that section, I will just get into a little bit um, about my research project, uh, which was a riparian planting plan for a small area of the Brunette River. Um, this will include a bit of background information, um, including an introduction to riparian ecosystems, an overview of the Brunette watershed, and then um, my actual planning actions, such as my site assessment and my plan implementation. Um, and then Shan will talk about his ARP, which was focused on potential plants that can be used for battling reed canary grass. Uh, so what exactly is the ER program about and what makes it so special? So to my surprise, it was actually Canada's first uh, master's program specializing in ecological restoration. So I think there are a couple more now, but still not very many. Uh, the program started in 2015, so there's only been a few graduating classes up until now. Um, it's a joint program between SFU and BCIT, uh, so time is split between uh, each of the schools evenly, with just a couple more required credits at BCIT. Um, for us, we had our first few classes in person and then switched to online learning, so it being taught at different schools wasn't that noticeable for us. Uh, and it's a two year, five term course and goes straight through um, the summer. So essentially you do any data collection during the summer when you don't have classes and it's considered your third term. And when Shan and I were accepted, they were taking about 20 students per year, um, but we agree that they're probably gonna be increasing that. Um, he thinks it's probably more like 25 now just because the demand is growing so quickly. So what makes the program special? Uh, so for one, like I said um, on the other slide, it really is one of a kind and is focused pretty specifically on applying restoration to different ecosystems and in different scenarios. Um, the more theoretical content is taught at SFU, but then you also get this applied technical training from BCIT. And this includes things like writing a restoration plan, uh, learning about real world actions like obtaining permits. And then there's also a field school component um, and a bit of traveling. So we didn't actually get to do a lot of the traveling that we were supposed to do just because of COVID, um, but BCIT did manage to safely arrange a few safe uh, field school activities for us. Um, so in the picture, uh, you can see a couple of the students from our cohort uh, with their masks on doing amphibian surveys. Um, and then there is the research, the assisted research project. So the program is a course-based master's, um, but we do have a research project component, which really is the main focus of the degree. So the ARP is definitely the most time consuming part of the program, um, but you can more or less tailor your courses to what interests you so that you can focus them on the topic of your ARP. Uh, so Shan was saying as well about how great it is that you don't really have to learn about anything that you don't want to, because um, you can almost, there are some required courses, but you can pick your courses um, to help you learn things that you can apply um, when you do your ARP. And when you pick your ARP, you can actually do it in pretty much anything you'd like, as long as it somehow pertains to restoration. So that was just a general outline of the program um, and why we liked it, but what exactly is ecological restoration? So we all know that ecology is the study of the relationships between organisms, as well as the relationships between organisms and their surroundings. And it follows that restoration ecology is the study behind methods that are used to assist in reestablishing these relationships once they've been disturbed, um, particularly by humans. And so ecological restoration then is the applied portion of restoration ecology, 
um, where you essentially take these methods and then put them to practice. Um, so this could be both in the planning stages and in the actual hands-on work. And in the master's program, uh, we really did both restoration ecology and ecological restoration, since you can't really have one without the other. So the overarching goal of ecological restoration is to bring an ecosystem that has been negatively impacted in some way back to its original or, or historical condition. Um, so there are two types of restoration that we learn about. Um, passive restoration, which is when you just essentially need to remove whatever stressor is harming the ecosystem and it can eventually restore itself naturally. naturally. Um, so for example, removing a source of pollution to a stream. And then there's active restoration, which is a bit more involved. Um, it requires that you both remove the stressor as well as take some sort of action to improve the function of the ecosystem, um, whether this is by planting vegetation or adding large wood to a stream or building a wetland or really any works that will increase the benefits of the ecosystem, um, both to the biota that live there and to the humans, um, because we all benefit from ecosystem services as well. Um, so you can see in this image that reducing an impact might send an ecosystem on a trajectory towards full recovery, um, but that it really is a process and that fully recovering native ecosystems in any realistic time frame might demand some major human involvement, which is often quite expensive um, and labor intensive, um, but it does depend on the situation. Um, and you can really only say that an ecosystem has been restored when it is existing in its natural native condition. Um, and given the extent of human influence on our environment uh, in this day and age, it probably isn't as common. But nonetheless, that should always be the goal wherever possible. So if the goal of ecological restoration is to reach some historical state, how do we know when our goals have been met? Uh, so what is the historical condition? So in some areas, there could be past surveys done, historical photos or maps. Um, and another one that we discuss is using Indigenous recollection of, for example, the amount of fish or different medicinal plants that used to be in a certain area. Um, an alternative to using historical conditions is to use a reference ecosystem. So this is a similar ecosystem just in a different area that may represent a healthier state. Um, and this is also quite difficult, especially in urban areas because human impacts are so widespread that it's often difficult to find anywhere that might be representative of any natural state at all. So because ecological restoration is an applied science, uh, we don't just get to indulge in the ecology and the sciencey side of things where we deal with wildlife and apply scientific concepts. But in practice, we actually learn a lot about planning and budgeting and prioritization and all of these things that um, might not be quite as exciting. Um, so we might have to allocate funds to certain areas if they have a higher chance of success or have a greater positive impact. Um, this is especially true for watershed restoration because anything that happens upstream directly is going to affect downstream areas. And we also try and prioritize restoring processes. Um, so rather than prescribing a quick fix, um, trying to really understand the ecosystem and what is causing the problem uh, with the goal of making it truly self-sustaining in the long run. Um, and there are also prioritizations um, in the species that you might be focusing on. Uh, sometimes a species at risk or an economically valuable species might take precedence over another. And of course, we learn about things like regional timing windows um, and making sure you are applying for all of the right permits to do the work that you need to do. Um, and then finally, after your plan is in place, making sure that you're maintaining your work, uh, monitoring your efforts so that you can see what worked and what didn't. Um, and if anything else might be needed to ensure that your project is successful. Uh, so these are just some examples of putting ER to practice. Um, I wanted to put this slide in here specifically for the picture because this is probably one of the coolest things I think we did in field school. Um, but we got to do things like wetland construction, uh, habitat feature installation. So that's the picture on the right. Um, we actually got to go out and ballast large wood to boulders to create salmon habitat in North Vancouver. Uh, we didn't do all of those, but they showed us how to do it. And I think we did maybe one, <laughs> um, but it was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, some other examples would be, you know, rebuilding coral reefs, uh, lake aeration, slope stabilization, um, and repairing uh, revegetation, uh, which brings me to my ARP. Um, so that was kind of it for my general outline of the course and some of the main things that we learned.
Um, but now we'll get into my assisted research project, uh, where I really applied a lot of these ideas to create a riparian planting plan uh, in a real world scenario and in the face of a large development project um, on the Brunette River. Uh, so just for some context, um, before I dive into the actual restoration planning phase of the project, um, I wanted to first just provide an overview of riparian ecosystems and give a bit of background information on the Brunette watershed. Um, so my apologies if, if people already know this, um, these sorts of things, but I thought it was pretty important to go over just in case it's new information to anyone. So repairing areas are, I'm very passionate about repairing areas as, as you'd already said, um, but they're essentially the transition zone between freshwater streams and upland habitat, um, but can be used to, to describe areas around other types of water bodies as well, such as wetlands or lakes. Um, I have been fascinated with riparian areas since I learned about them in my undergrad. Um, they are one of the most diverse, productive, and complex ecosystems ever. And this is largely because they are shaped by regular natural disturbances, such as wind, fire, and flooding. And these constant disturbances mean the formation of many different habitat types, uh, which support a greater diverse, diversity of species. And so it's no surprise that riparian areas are shaped by their streams. Um, they're influenced by the movement of water through natural processes like flooding, erosion, and sediment deposition. These processes then determine which species will survive in the riparian zone because they play a part in soil type, moisture availability, and nutrients. Um, in fact, one study I recently saw found that about 24% of the nitrogen in riparian plants is ocean derived. Uh, so they could directly link the nitrogen in the riparian plants to salmon spawning and decaying in the riparian zone. And just as importantly, riparian ecosystems shape their streams. Um, so riparian areas control stream temperatures through shading. They stabilize the stream bank and mediate erosion. Their vegetation influences stream hydrology by reducing overland flow through interception, uh, intercepting rain and roughening the ground to increase water infiltration. Uh, they regulate nutrient sediments and contaminants. They supply large wood to the stream, and this can retain spawning gravels and create pools, um, as well as provide protective cover for many aquatic species. Um, and different vegetation even dictates which types of insects will fall into the stream, uh, which then impacts stream food web dynamics. So they're very, very amazing ecosystems, and you really can't have one without the other. So then the question is, uh, what happens when the land is developed by urbanization, industrialization, agriculture, forestry, and other forms of, of resource extraction, and these riparian zones are removed? Which brings me to the Burnett watershed, um, which is actually the most highly urbanized watershed in the lower mainland. Uh, so just to touch on a bit of the general facts regarding the, the Burnett watershed. Uh, so it covers about 73 kilometers squared of land in the lower mainland, uh, most of which lies within Burnaby. Um, it acts as an urban refuge for a variety of biotas, many of them at risk, uh, such as the endangered nutsack dace, the northern red-legged frog, great blue heron, um, and many, many more. And it provides regional connectivity for species to move from the Fraser River to Burnaby Lake and to Still Creek um, throughout Vancouver and the many mostly paved over um, tributaries throughout Vancouver. Before development, the Burnett Basin was used extensively by the Coast Salish. Um, it is particularly noted for its intensive cultural purposes, so things like spiritual activities and even potential burial grounds. They used it as a travel route throughout the region from the Fraser River where they would fish for salmon and Yulicon uh, to the Deer and Burnaby Lake area for lake fishing and cranberry picking to Burnaby Mountain for early spring berry picking and the best deer and bear hunting um, all the way to Burrard Inlet for shellfish and other marine resources. And the Brunette River itself was historically forested. Um, it was slow flowing, uh, sinuous, and had a highly diverse riparian area typical of coastal western hemlock uh, dry maritime floodplain sites. In the 1820s, European settlers began arriving, um, and by the 1880s, logging had more or less stripped the region of forests. So the rivers were straightened and the banks were diked to support agriculture and reduce flooding. Um, so reducing flooding, that's one of those natural disturbances that are so important to the diversity of stream ecosystems. By the 1900s, there were major losses to many of the resources that Indigenous communities depended on, um, and eventually both the elk and herring stocks collapsed. <clears throat> 
Between 1892 and 1961, Burnaby's population alone increased from about 250 to over 100,000 people, uh, which led to an increase in road networks and traffic. And by the 1960s and 70s, the Salmon Run was practically eliminated from the Brunette River altogether. In the 1980s, coho salmon returned, but only in very low numbers. Um, so approximately 60 individuals uh, returning per year. Um, so this picture isn't a great representation of change uh, just because the top photo is really not that old. So it's only from 1951. Um, but even since then, you can see the, the decrease in the darker areas, uh, which shows all the greenery and then the increase in the urban density, which is kind of the light gray area. So since there has been, um, since then, there has been major impacts to improve conditions in the watershed, uh, many of which occurring in the Brunette River were conducted by the Saberton Fishing Game Club. Um, so they release salmon and trout fry every year. Um, there was an engineered fishway. So in the picture there, um, it was added onto Caribou Dam to permit fish passage. And there have been many other efforts as well, um, including adding weirs to increase dissolved oxygen levels and adding spawning habitat, um, so gravels and large wood. And these efforts have really made a difference uh, to improve conditions a lot in the past few decades. So we went from having absolutely no salmon um, to having still some endangered species. Um, and you can find coho, pink, chum, steelhead, and cut throat, throat again in the brunette, um, as well as several species of conservation concerns. So northern red-legged frog, the Pacific water shrew, um, and of course the endangered mitsack dace. Um, but it does still suffer from past development um, and is obviously still at risk of future development. So as, a, as an urban watershed, um, the brunette is subjected to extensive persistent stressors and their impacts, as well as the lingering impacts from historical degradation um, as the land was urbanized. Um, so these are just a couple pictures I took um, at my site. So, you know, there's, you know, random culverts. I have no idea what what's, that's putting into the river. Um, and the bottom picture there just shows how flashy the flows were. So that's that's the first rain in September. And it went from probably being like half a meter deep to being like at least two meters deep um, in maybe an hour. So it's pretty crazy. I know there is a lot going on um, in this slide, but I have this in my report and I just wanted to share some of the connections between these issues um, that the Burnett watershed faces. So some notable ones would be, you know, the removal of, um, of riparian vegetation. So in the red box there, uh, it increases over land flow and bank instability, which causes sedimentation of the gravel substrates. Removal of riparian vegetation also increases water temperatures and lowers dissolved oxygen levels. And it can also increase non-native species, um, which reduces diversity in the riparian zone. And in the case of Himalayan blackberry can actually further perpetrate more erosion and, and sedimentation. Um, so it's kind of a positive reinforcement loop. All of these uh, stressors and impacts are feeding off each other and, and making matters a lot worse. Um, and so these things are largely connected. So certain stressors might cause an impact that has a direct or in, indirect impact on something else. Um, so it is really uh, causes a lot of challenges for restoration, uh, especially with climate change as well which if you can see at the bottom there, um, is predicted to increase the intensity of rainfall events in the winter and drought conditions in the summer here in the Pacific Northwest. And that means even flashier winter flows with more erosion and then warmer summer water temperatures with low dissolved oxygen, lower dissolved oxygen. And so how do all of these things impact the biota? Um, as an example, the Burnett River is critical habitat to the endangered nutsack base, um, and they are very sensitive to pollution, sedimentation, and hypoxia, so low dissolved oxygen in the water. And this is because they often live in the cobbles of streams and feed in highly oxygenated riffle habitat. Uh, so it has been found that if suitable habitat were available, nutsack dace populations would actually be quite high. Um, they have, uh, for their, because of their life history, they have quite a high uh, reproductive rate relative to other species. Um, but they did sampling in 2018 and, and they only caught two individuals out of 100 traps. So uh, numbers are quite low. And like nutsack dace, uh, salmonids are also really sensitive to sedimentation due to them building their reds in gravels. Um, but they are also particularly sensitive to losses in terrestrial prey inputs, in-stream complexity, and higher water temperatures that come from removing riparian vegetation. 
And then these higher water temperatures not only impact salmonids directly or through lower dissolved oxygen levels, but also because they select for invasive fish like the largemouth bass, um, which you can see in the picture there, uh, which has actually been uh, seen more recently migrating from the Fraser River and preying on coho fry. Um, and they think that's because of the warmer water temperatures. And I mean, that's just fish. Um, development in the brunette basin has drastically reduced the diversity of many biotas. Uh, lower breeding bird diversity has been linked to higher Himalayan blackberry cover, which is abundant pretty much everywhere in the basin. There's a lack of large trees for perching and nesting outside of less developed areas. And this reduction in repairing cover, um, in addition to pollution and other things, has likely impacted amphibians in the brunette, as uh, since the majority of amphibians in the Pacific Northwest, so about 89%, depend on forested uh, riparian habitat to keep things wet and humid. Uh, so that was it for a bit of the background information. Um, now to actually get into the replanting plan. Um, so first things first, a site assessment has to be completed to understand the specific um, area that is to be restored. And in this section, I'll go over things like the product, uh, project context, um, my restoration questions, sampling methods, site conditions, um, and ultimately my restoration uh, vision. So for a bit of project context, essentially Trans Mountain has proposed works all along the northeast side of the Burnett River. Uh, my project was in relation to one small area where they will be encroaching on the 30 meter buffer zone designated as critical habitat for the endangered nutsack days. Um, so they have committed to reclaiming the disturbed habitat to pre-construction conditions, which provides an opportunity for improvement from its current state. Um, and I even had the support of Coquitlam First Nations uh, since this area is so culturally um, important to them. And I actually just drove by this site the other day and they've started construction and there's a bunch of people protesting. So it's kind of cool having um, been kind of a part of that. All right, so this is my site location. Um, it just shows the extent of the restoration area in relation to the Burnett watershed. Um, it is obviously quite small, um, but important nonetheless. The Burnett River is highlighted in blue on the map there, and the restoration area itself is owned by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. So it's in the highway right of way. So for the assisted research project, it was helpful to outline my plan into four sort of uh, research questions just to keep my priorities straight. Uh, so what are the current conditions at the project site in terms of vegetation, soil, and water quality? What is the most beneficial revegetation design for addressing the riparian habitat needs of native species while also planting for site conditions, invasion risk, and indigenous culture? What strategies are available for controlling highly competitive non-native species in riparian ecosystems, and will they be appropriate for the project site? And what other additions might increase the ecological value of the area? So for my baseline data, I first mapped out my site and delineated it into four management units, uh, roadside cover, snowberry shrubland, remnant riparian, and high slope blackberry. And then I did a stratified random sampling design for vegetation uh, using 31 16 meter square quadrats um, that you can see in the map there. And then for soils, I dug five soil pits selectively, um, just avoiding slopes and bare ground because I didn't wanna um, cause any erosion issues. And I recorded things like horizon depth, soil texture, structure, pH, nutrients, et cetera. And then for water quality, I did seven samples biweekly from spring to fall. Um, and I also got some data from Metro Vancouver for 2016 um, that included the same parameters as well as trace metal contaminants such as copper, iron, lead, and zinc. So just a basic overview of some of my results. Um, unsurprisingly, I found that non-native species were largely dominant and that there were few trees at the site, particularly conifers. Um, the ones that were there uh, seemed quite stressed. I found that there were some native species present, but that native diversity was still quite low, uh, ranging from between zero and 0 0.23 out of one. Um, so I used the Simpsons diversity index to, to find that value. Uh, for soils, all units sampled were low in nutrients, particularly nitrogen, and were coarse textured, meaning that conditions are likely quite dry in the summer, even drier than, than Vancouver summers generally are anyways, um, since the soil can't hold moisture very well. And then they also had modeling beginning at about 30 centimeters into the soil profile, indicating a fluctuating water table. Um, so just as an example, you can see on the right that in the remnant riparian unit, there was an abundance of Himalayan blackberry, 
Uh, the soils were composed of a sandy loam overlaying a sandy clay loam, and they were somewhat acidic. So I really only had two different, um, uh, in terms of soil anyways, two different uh, types of ecosystems, I guess. Or, um, and then for water quality, dissolved oxygen was less than the chronic minimum of eight required for aquatic species for May, June, August, and September. Um, so low, but just barely under the, the required number. Um, however, in the real world, more rigorous monitoring would be needed to confirm this. And turbidity may have been within the BC water quality guidelines, um, as the average throughout the 2020 period was 4.13. Um, which is quite low, so low is good for turbidity, so um, that wasn't really a concern, but for turbidity, you, you're really wanting to take samples in the winter, which we didn't really have a, a winter sampling period. Um, but I did take one extra sample during a rain event that did detect a turbidity level above 20, um, and the literature does state that the brunette has turbidity issues. Uh, so as a reference, a turbidity of 20 could affect salmonids by impacting their feeding ability because um, it's more difficult for them to see their prey. But again, more samples, especially during storm periods, are needed. And then for temperature, uh, samples detected levels above the optimal ranges for many salmonid species associated with the brunette, uh, reaching over 20 degrees in 2016 and an average of almost 18 degrees in 2020. Um, for comparison, the max preferred rearing temperature for coho is 14.6, and they're not even the most sensitive of the salmonids. Um, of the trace metals, zinc and iron were the more, most concerning. Uh, zinc surpassed both the chronic and the acute limits uh, during the wet period at 17.34 and 41.5 micrograms per liter. And iron was over the one milligram per liter limit for both August and September. Um, so those two are probably quite a concern. Um, but I, I did this more so just for the practice. All of this is confirmed in the literature. It's, it's pretty well known that the brunette has poor, poor water quality. Um, so after the summer, after I did my sampling, this is kind of the base map um, that I came up with. Uh, so it shows the management units, uh, some of the features that I documented, the trees, et cetera. Uh, so this helped me to create my plan and to decide, you know, what I can plant where and where I should install different habitat features. Um, so a lot of these decisions were dependent on where the infrastructure is, um, just because it is an urban area. So that was one of the main concerns. So some key things to notice for the map, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you know, the location of the power line, um, the red line is the, the brunette interceptor and the future location of the pipeline is in gray, as well as current habitat features. Um, so a few years ago, they had already installed coarse and standing deadwood clusters. Um, so those are the brown dot in line there. And I also added a few photos just on the side um, of some of the species that I saw on site visits, uh, just because it really shows that even though it is so urban, uh, industrialized right beside a highway there, um, it is still very ecologically important because it really is, there's not a lot of um, green space left. So everything kind of hides there. <laughs> So despite some of the limitations to planting, um, just because of all of the human infrastructure at the site, there is still opportunity for improvement from its current state. Unfortunately, infrastructural constraints really do limit what could be done to improve conditions in the river. Um, so planting specifically beside the river to influence water quality or, or shading or anything like that. Um, and that's particularly because of the power line. So it dictated vegetation heights and therefore in-stream shading couldn't really be targeted. Um, and then the underground infrastructure elsewhere really limited the number of trees in general that could be planted just because of the root systems. Uh, so that being said, invasive species could still be reduced and replaced with a variety of native species um, suited to the site. Some of the functions that can be targeted for planting are riparian structure and habitat heterogeneity, uh, sustenance, uh, native pollination, and improvements to soil and water quality. All right, so that was um, my site assessment um, in a nutshell. And now I'm going to get into my project implementation. So my specific goals and objectives, uh, site preparation, planting prescriptions, and necessary monitoring maintenance activities. So all the fun stuff. Uh, so essentially my overarching goal for the project was to improve the ecological function of the site for terrestrial and aquatic biotas, and to increase the cultural importance of the area uh, to First Nations, so particularly Coquitlam.
Uh, so my first objective was to reduce the abundance of non-native species within the project area to promote the establishment of native vegetation. And to achieve this, I would need to remove 100% of priority invasive species using appropriate methods for the site and to facilitate planting and reduce competition, uh, remove priority invasive regrowth and monitor and manage non-native species like agronomic grasses um, at the site because those are really one of the biggest threats to plantings. They just soak up all of the moisture. And my second objective was to establish a variety of native species within the project area through planting and seeding efforts. And to accomplish this, I would need to seed uh, bare areas with a native seed mix appropriate for the site. Monitoring must report at least 80% ground cover in year one and should be maintained throughout the monitoring period. Install plantings in the fall, success will be determined by a survival of at least 80% for each monitoring year and a minimum of 50% growth of trees by year five and install beaver exclusion fencing and wrap bases of high risk species for vole control. My third objective was to manage immediate habitat availability by maintaining and increasing habitat features within the project area. Uh, so relocating the coarse and standing deadwood clusters to an area outside of the pipeline right of way um, because they have to be able to maintain and monitor the pipeline as well. Add at least two pieces of coarse wood greater than four meters long with a diameter of at least 30 centimeters and install at least two bird nesting boxes and one bat box in appropriate areas post planting. And my last objective was to foster meaningful relationships with Coquitlam Nation through the inclusion of members throughout the restorative process um, by employing members of Coquitlam throughout site preparation, replanting, and monitoring and maintenance stages of the project. So for site preparation, uh, the focus was on controlling non-native species while plantings establish. Um, because of the sensitivity of the site being in a riparian zone and so close to water, um, all species must be controlled manually, mechanically, or culturally, uh, just through the creation of shade. Um, and the use of chemicals is generally not recommended, um, just maybe as kind of a contingency plan if nothing else is working. And then for agronomic grass management, spot scarification or soil inversion using an excavator were chosen for maintaining a weed-free zone around plantings. Uh, so spot scarification is just when they remove the top layer of sod. I'm sure everyone has seen that before. Um, and then soil inversion is when they essentially flip over the planting site, um, burying the grasses beneath the mineral layer. Some additional things I had to consider uh, were species selection. Um, so I based mine on several factors, including biogeoclimatic zone classification, indigenous value, um, site requirements. So based on current conditions, drought tolerance was a huge one and ecological function. Um, planting density and stock sizing reflected competition with invasive species. Um, so planting closer together increases their ability to compete. Um, I chose a coarse wood chip mulch as the main form at the site, infrequent deep watering for irrigation, and I chose not to use any chemical fertilizers either, um, but just to plant deciduous trees that can add organic matter and nitrogen to the soil. Uh, from what I've read, chemical fertilizers can actually uh, select for invasive species and make, make matters worse. Um, and then of course, predator protection. Um, so now for my prescriptions. Um, so for the snowberry shrubland unit, my strategy was variable density planting and using the nurse tree shelter wood approach. Um, so in other words, I planted trees at different spacing to increase the structural diversity of the site um, and planted conifers with deciduous trees that can act as nurse species. Plantings focused on underground utilities, uh, structure, nutrient additions. So planting things, you know, like alder and big leaf maple that can add a lot of um, nutrients and organic matter to the soil. Uh, contaminant uptake, so uh, certain willows are really good at taking up contaminants and erosion control. Um, so the table on the right just shows some of the species that I chose. Uh, so red osier dogwood, thimbleberry, et cetera. So continuing on with the snowberry shrubland unit, um, because the pipeline right of way can't be planted for maintenance purposes, I chose to propose a native riparian roadside grass mix for this area. Um, so the mix I chose was notable for erosion control, um, competition with non-native species, and having a low mature height just because it's uh, close enough to the river or to the road. So uh, drivers have to be able to see. Um, and it can be broadcast seeded with native forbs for pollination value. 
This grass mix can also be used for the roadside cover unit, uh, even closer to the road, which is in the picture there. Um, but instead of being broadcast seed, it had to be hydro seeded um, at a higher rate just because it is a slope um, and it, it's better for erosion control. For the remnant repairing unit, the strategy was dense spacing to protect from recolonization of invasive species from the river. Um, plantings focused on power line height restrictions, erosion control, and increasing uh, stream bank stability. And this area would have a coarse wood chip mulch for the majority of the unit, um, but then a core fiber matting um, would have to be used closer to the bank just because it helps to hold the bank together while the plantings establish. And again, my chosen plantings are in the table on the right. Um, so shorter bank stabilizing shrubs such as salmonberry and hardhack would be planted closer to the river just because of the power lines and then trees and taller shrubs like scowlers, willow and Pacific crab apple uh, planted farther away. For the high slope blackberry unit, I used dense spacing again for invasion resistance from the road. Um, we all know that people um, are pretty good at distributing invasive species around. Uh, plantings focused on slope stabilization, sight lines because it's closer to the highway, uh, drought tolerance and competitive ability. And this area could be hydro mulched with a wood fiber mulch and tackifier um, without any seed added to it. Um, and just giving monitoring results, you can decide later if you'd like to add grasses if, if the plants aren't establishing or erosion is a concern. And species in the table have uh, very variable rooting depths um, and are all known to be very efficient at stabilizing very steep slopes. So for example, snow, snow brush roots apparently can reach up to almost three meters deep. And it's just a shrub, not a tree, so. And for the last prescription, increasing immediate habitat availability by adding more coarse wood as it provides a variety of functions. Um, adding bird boxes, specifically the wood duck nesting box, because it can target many species that are found in the brunette. Um, so one of the notable ones was the western screech owl. Um, and adding a bat rocket box to target the little brown myotis, as it's threatened by white nose syndrome in eastern Canada, and populations need to be maintained as, as the disease moves farther west. So this was kind of my final deliverable um, in the program. Uh, so this is my planting map. I have all of the species color coded. Uh, the size of the circles show the spacing. So the smaller circles represent plants spaced closer together. All the stock sizes and everything are listed in the table on the right, including the habitat features, um, which have been placed strategically on the map. Uh, so for example, bat boxes facing south. Um, and I also just listed some of the clearances for various types of infrastructure at the bottom. Um, so this map was actually quite fun to make. Um, it was the time I kind of got to get creative and it gave me an opportunity to really visualize the plan. Um, and it also doubles as a guide for if, if this plan was ever implemented, you know, you can just pass it off to somebody else. And so no restoration plan will ever be complete without monitoring. Um, this is essentially determines if any maintenance is required or if your plan needs to be tweaked due to any unforeseen circumstances. Uh, so for this plan specifically, the main parameters to be monitored included uh, invasive species encroachment, which is a huge one, especially in this area, um, animal damage and erosion. Um, and then it's important also in monitoring to have specific time frames. So uh, I chose the monitoring to occur soon after completion, every 45 days in the first two growing seasons, and then biannually afterwards. Um, health and vigor of vegetation and stability and use of feature installations by fauna should also be monitored. And I chose for that to be monitored annually, um, just based on the literature and plant cover and species diversity, just whenever growth is sufficient. And I realize this is getting a little bit technical, um, but for my monitoring plan, I had to design sampling methods to monitor survival of plantings um, and changes to plant cover and diversity over time. So for example, I chose direct counts for trees um, with height and diameter measurements, just because tree growth is so important in riparian zones. Um, so it was important that that be closely monitored. Um, and cover and diversity monitoring could be conducted wherever possible using a method called the line intercept method. Um, so the picture on the right just kind of sums up my monitoring design. Um, but your actual monitoring sampling, specific sampling plan wouldn't really be uh, finished until the planting is over because you're not sure exactly what plants are going to work out and kind of have to tailor it to the site as you go.
Um, and similarly, uh, no restoration plan could be complete without maintenance. Um, so as well as a contingency plan in the case that things start going sideways. So some examples of maintenance activities include non-native species management. Uh, I know that's come up a few times. Uh, planting replacement species if the survival target is not met and reseeding bare areas susceptible to erosion. Um, and some examples of when alternative actions may be warranted include uh, changes to invasive species control methods. Uh, so for example, having to use chemicals um, or the frequency of, of those methods or replacing poorly surviving species with particularly vigorous species um, that would have been identified throughout monitoring. Uh, so for example, you might want to replace your salmon berry um, plantings with hard hack if the salmon berry isn't doing very well. And then just to conclude, um, the site did come with many infrastructural challenges that I had to work with, even in just such a small little area. And these are in addition to the fact that it really is just such a small area in the context of the Burnett River, and then also in the context of the Burnett Watershed. Um, so because of this, I tried to think of it more um, as just one of several potential habitat islands or stepping stones that could be enhanced in a larger urban landscape. Um, so potential areas identified are shown by the green polygons in the map there. Um, climate change is also an important consideration as it really highlights the importance of increasing riparian zones in these areas um, that are lacking. Um, because as temperatures increase, um, we're going to need to have more trees along the riparian areas to shade, to be able to shade the stream so it doesn't further impact the species that are still surviving in the corridor. And then also taking into account that riparian planting is really only one factor to consider um, and that although it should be a priority, especially with climate change, there are other major issues that are at least equally important, um, such as trying to improve the altered hydrology of the watershed, uh, which is a huge undertaking, um, and also reducing point sor source pollution because for many decades it's been used kind of just as a as a dumping ground for our sewage and, and everything, but hopefully that's increasing or getting better. Um, yeah, so on that note, I'd like to say thank you for all listening to me talk so much about my project and the program, and I hope it was at the very least informative, and I guess I'll pass it over to Shan now, unless anyone has any questions or, I don't know, are we doing that at the very end? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um we encouraging people to put their questions into the chat and then we'll we'll deal so they can put them in while they're fresh in their minds and then we'll deal with them all um after um we've heard from sean as well to kind of uh bridge bridge the two presentations um uh, so Sean's uh, thesis work in the same program aided a long-term research project uh, aimed at combating the invasive reed canary grass in the Lower Mainland. And since 2015, a collaborative project between BCIT, Metro Vancouver, uh, and the city of Surrey has explored the potential for using native shrub species to shade out the reed canary grass. Uh, so Sean will discuss the history of this plant invasion, uh, how the project started, and its key findings to date. Sean, please take it away. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, let me just bring up my presentation here. It's showing up okay? Great. Um, so yeah, my name is Shan, um, and I'm yeah another graduate from the um, Masters in Ecological Restoration, also from Cassandra's cohort. And uh, yeah, my ARP was um, rather than a actual restoration plan, was a, a bit more kind of like conventional research, but essentially looking into a, a very uh, yeah also real world application, uh, a very applied method for dealing with reed canary grass. Um, which some of you, of course, may be familiar with. It's a pretty nasty invasive in the region and uh, not only in the lower mainland, but much of BC and for that matter, much of North America. Uh, and for that matter, much of other continents as well. Uh, it really is everywhere. So essentially what this project was looking at was rather than you know relying on more conventional approaches such as you know herbicide or, um, or, or physical removal, um, which often has very limited effectiveness with dealing with this species. This was essentially looking at establishing live staked native shrub species um, to ultimately kind of shade it out and outcompete it in that sense. Um, 
And so kind of letting them do most of the grunt work for us. So, um, yeah, so I guess who am I and uh, how did I get into restoration and into this program and into this project uh, is what, what, are, what better way to start the presentation with hard hitting existential questions. So um, yeah, I mean, as far as I can remember, I've always had a pretty keen interest in animals and in nature. Uh, the plants are a more recent thing. Most of my pictures are definitely with animals and <laughs> that sort of thing. But um, so yeah, I mean, coming out of high school, I just basically wanted to study something to do with animals. So I went into uh, UBC's Applied Animal Biology program. Uh, and then from there, I really just kind of fell in love with the science of ecology. I uh, didn't really know where I wanted to specialize in within that, but my very last semester, I took a course in ecological restoration, and that's when everything sort of clicked. I just really loved kind of being able to utilize all of the, you know, the cool science of ecology and all the cool principles that we learned, but then actually, you know, apply them in a, in a very real world, very tangible way. Um, and, uh, you know, actually get out and get your hands dirty. And what I love about restoration is that it also, you know, lets you really see um, you know, it lets you see the results of your work rather than, you know, putting out a paper and hoping somebody reads it or something. <laughs> um, it's, it's very much like, you know, you, you get in there and you see what an area looks like after it's been treated, um, which, you know, with a lot of these restoration plants is, is a very rewarding experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, that seemed like a great fit for me, uh, I did some searching, found the restoration program, which I, I think again, at the time was probably the only, or at least one of the only programs of its kind, um, in certainly in Western Canada, maybe even in the whole country. Uh, so that's where I ended up. Um, so, uh, I've always kind of been interested in invasives. Uh, I kind of have a love hate relationship with them. Uh, hate for very obvious reasons, love or just this kind of fascinating uh, moral and ecological dilemma of what to do with them and how to manage them. Um, and I'm sure many of you have at least a, a pretty decent familiarity with why they're bad, but I guess just in a, in a very general sense, um, yeah, a brief overview is that in many cases they do uh, really degrade ecological structure and function. Um, and this can be things like, you know, altering fire regimes or, or uh, choking up streams uh, or, or very kind of direct biodiversity loss impacts, such as outcompeting native species um, in kind of altering habitat structure, that sort of thing. Um, they also have really big economic impact. Uh, this will often be things like, you know, weedy species in agricultural fields, for example. Um, so they definitely really do need to be managed, uh, not just ecologically, but also for all kinds of human-centered reasons. Um, and yeah, in many cases, these are species that are very well adapted for rapid spread and establishment. Um, you'll often find areas that you know only have a few individuals one year, and then you know one or two years later have just been completely taken over. And uh, in in some cases, they really can just displace everything else. So some pictures of our uh, some of our lovely local beasties um, here and, and what really they can lead to if they're untreated. Uh, and in some cases, they can even cause what's called invasional meltdown, which basically just refers to this idea of um, creating the conditions that are more conducive for other invasives to invade or uh, same or other invasive species to, to establish and further dominate. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I my project at least focused on reed canary grass, which is one of these lovely invasive plants. Um, so they say, know thy enemy. So I figured the best place to start would be some identification. Um, so you can all see it and uh, I don't know, yank it out or something next time you come across it. <laughs> so one of the things that stands out about this plant is that it's really tall, up to two meters. Certainly in my field sites, uh, I had plenty of tall, uh, plants that were much taller than I am. Um, the other distinguishing feature is that the leaves are flat and very wide. So they're up to two and a half centimeters. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but certainly for grasses, that is quite a bit larger than most of the things that you'll be coming across. Um, it has a large and prominent ligule as well. So the ligule is basically that um, 
kind of see-through whitish uh, membrane that is clasping around the stem where the leaf attaches. Uh, and it also will have prominent nodes. Uh, another thing worth looking out for, uh, in, at least as far as low ground stuff goes, is that it forms, uh, it has a really dense mat of roots uh, and these form a pretty thick sod. And it also has very large, very prominent rhizomes uh, and it spreads very aggressively through those as well as by seed. Uh, as well, one thing I've noticed is that the um, last year's growth, kind of the, the dead shoots, they often stay standing and they persist quite well throughout, throughout the winter and in to the next year long before they kind of start to decompose. So uh, I took this picture a few days ago only. And so you can see all of that kind of lighter tan, all those clumps there. That's actually last year's growth. Um, and it's dead, but still standing. Uh, and then pretty much everything green that you see in between those is uh, this year's growth of new reef near grass. So you can see that while there wasn't necessarily much there last year, uh, now there is going to be quite a bit of it as it grows up this year. Uh, so just to show you yeah, how quickly it can really spread and establish in an area. So uh, I kind of call it the hybrid from hell. It is a really interesting species, but a kind of interesting story. Uh, and it's pretty unique as far as invasives go. Uh, um, because as you might not necessarily expect it to parts of North America, um, but it is also native to many other continents. Um, the thing that makes it interesting is it's actually within the same species invasive varieties that we're talking about. So um, what happened was beginning in the mid 1800s, they actually introduced various European varieties, French, Czech, what have you, uh, whatever they had, I'm sure. Uh, into North America as they were kind of colonizing it, mainly for a forage crop, but also for soil stabilization and other things. And basically what happened is that all those introduced varieties started interbreeding with each other and also with the native variety uh, and all of this different kind of genetic material that they had to select from allowed them to form this really, really aggressively spreading invasive hybrid that was just very well adapted to not only the fields that they were planted in, but really, you know, riparian areas, and wetlands and all kinds of different habitats. So naturally they escaped the farm and ended up just spreading all across the continent. And uh, yeah, so then you get this invasive hybrid that we're dealing with today. So whereas the North American variety was uh, uncommon in the past, it's actually still around, but it's now very rare. You can basically only find it in uh, parts of Alaska and kind of northeastern Canada, like around Hudson's Bay. Um, pretty much everything that you see now is going to be some version of this invasive hybrid. Um, and it's pretty interesting because it's an example of what's known as an intraspecific cryptic invasion. Um, so there's not too many of those. And essentially what that means is intraspecific just means you're dealing with, you know, the same species, you're just talking about different varieties of it. And uh, cryptic means that we don't really no, at least not, we don't have a very full picture of kind of the history of this invasion. So because there were different varieties introduced uh, multiple times at different periods in history at different parts of the continent, it's just this big mess of tracking all this different genetic material. Um, and yeah, I mean, nobody really knows for sure kind of how all that works, but we just know there's a whole lot of invasive varieties and they're all hybridizing with each other. Great. So the plant uh, really is a formidable foe. Uh, like I mentioned before, it forms these really extensive below ground rhizome networks. So uh, no matter what you do above ground, it can often still be capable of spreading below ground. Um, and the seeds, uh, yeah, it is a very prolific seed producer up to 600 seeds per head. So basically per single stem uh, in a year. And each of those typically has about a four year viability, although they can last much longer. Uh, and yeah, when conditions are favorable, it often will displace pretty much any other native vegetation and form these really, really dense monotypic stands. So just the one species growing just, you know, shoulder to shoulder. Not that they have shoulders, but whatever the grass equivalent is. Um, so they'll thrive in typically wet or moist areas, uh, in high nutrient areas and in flat open areas with lots of sunlight. But like I mentioned before, with all these different varieties and all this genetic material, um, they are super well adaptable and you'll find them in 
many other areas as well. Uh, they really turn up just about everywhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're kind of an interesting case because they are quite resistant to most conventional control measures that you, know, you would use for a lot of other invasive species. So I'm just kind of going to give a brief overview, um, mostly from my research of kind of what some of these control methods are. Uh, many of these are, you know, common with other plant species as well, but uh, specifically talking about sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of how they've been used with reed canary grass and what works, what doesn't. Um, and so definitely the place to start is herbicide. That is the most common way that uh, a lot of invasives are dealt with. Um, and yeah, certainly for reed canary grass as well as others, it's kind of the quick and dirty way. Um, what happens in a lot of cases is that you'll more or less become dependent on ongoing applications. Um, I mean, that said, it is definitely effective. Uh, one study that I have here, for example, found that after just two applications, uh, there was a 95% reduction. Um, and yeah, it is often best combined with other methods. So some research found that it is even more effective and has more lasting impacts with, uh, when combined with plowing or mowing, uh, I believe burning as well. Um, as long as you do it in such a way that it, you know, doesn't target uh, other vegetation that is there to kind of take over and replace it. Mechanical removal is also common, uh, pretty straightforward. So that just kind of refers to any sort of cutting, mowing, tilling, that sort of thing. Uh, one method within that worth mentioning is uh, seed head trimming. So essentially what that means is that uh, you go in kind of mid season once the plants kind of have their seed heads up but before those seeds are actually mature and then you just lop off the seed head stem so you can do that even with just you know a weed whacker or something uh, you know which is much less intensive than actually hitting up a full plant and removing it from base uh, all you do is just target the seed head and you can cover much more ground much more quickly um, and yeah you just do that before it matures and you don't allow it to spread by seed. So there has been some evidence that that works. Um, and even just as a local example, I know there's a group that's been doing it uh, at with a small invasion uh, on Cypress Park. And um, apparently that's been working out for them pretty well. The problem with this method is that it doesn't target anything below ground. So like I mentioned before, it does also spread by rhizome. So you can be cutting off the seed heads all you want, but it might still be spreading below ground and still sending up new shoots elsewhere. Um, and the other thing with anything mechanical removal is that almost any fragment of this plant, whether you're talking uh, stem, whether you're talking root, rhizome, plant, uh, leaf fragment, is capable of reestablishing. So it is well and truly hard to kill. Um, burying is another method. Uh, and the big sort of challenge with this one is that uh, this plant really puts out some huge, huge seed banks. So one study here found that just within a square meter of soil, there was over 5,000 seeds. Um, and that is pretty common in areas where it's really taken over. Uh, another study by one of the same authors found uh, or they were experimenting with burying it. And uh, one treatment with five centimeters of burial, just covering it with soil, really only reduced germination by 20%. So um, using this method, you really have to bury it quite deep. Uh, and uh, yeah, one other thing to consider is that you're going to want to leave it undisturbed as long as possible because one study found that even uh, some seeds still germinated after 30 years. So granted, that's not quite common. I think generally uh, it's about a four year viability for most seeds, but even if just a few of them survive that long, you could be dealing with a new infestation very quickly. So solarization is another method that has sometimes been used. Um, essentially, you would lay out a plastic or a rubber or a fabric tarp. Um, and what it does is it kind of traps the sun's energy and it really just cooks anything underneath. So it raises the soil temperature and that kills off any either live plants that are underneath or any seeds. Um, so it really kind of depletes the seed bank and anything in there. Um, it seems to work pretty well. Uh, the main sort of drawbacks are that it is obviously pretty um, resource and, and time intensive. You have to buy and, and lay out all of this material and then collect it afterward. And um, 
personally, I also don't love the idea of kind of killing off any potential beneficial soil biota. So, uh, you know, whether that's insects and fungi and, and really anything below ground that isn't necessarily just a plant. Uh, flooding is another one. Uh, this one is definitely challenging for large areas, as you can imagine. Um, most people don't really have the infrastructure or even, you know, the landscape to do this. So it's uh, not usually an option. Um, and yeah, it is tricky because it turns out reed canary grass actually sort of likes flooding. Um, if you do it early in the season or if you don't do it for long enough, it tends to bounce back even stronger. Um, and especially if you do it in areas where sedimentation or eutrophication are a risk. So eutrophication just meaning um, in, in high nutrient conditions. Uh, it also loves that. So um, yeah, the big thing with that one is you wanna make sure you do it for long enough, at least a year, <laughs> ideally two years. Um, yeah, I mean, that is how long it takes to kill this plant. Like I said, it is very difficult to kill. Uh, the other concern with this method is that the seeds are actually buoyant. So um, if there are live seeds while you're trying this and there is some kind of water flow, uh, it may actually just disperse them to new areas and start a new infestation elsewhere. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is a very common concern with a lot of invasive species, not just reed canary grass. Burning is something else that has been tried, um, again, with sort of mixed success. For this one, uh, interestingly, the timing is pretty important. Uh, I found one study that observed uh, when they did burns in the spring, it did actually work for uh, decreasing reed canary grass biomass. But when they did a summer treatment, that actually increased reed canary grass biomass. So not too sure what the difference was with that, but something to keep in mind if you ever find yourself torching reed canary grass. Um, as well, the frequency. Uh, so one study found that it does work best with a two to three year burn cycle. Uh, um, more might be way too damaging for action and less often might give it way more opportunity to kind of regrow and reestablish. Um, yeah, again though, you know, especially in any kind of urban or peri-urban area, it is hard enough to get whatever permits and stuff, you need to do something like this. So pulling that off every two to three years is probably a big hassle. I don't know, I've never burned a field, so I uh, can't speak from experience, but it sounds like a tricky, tricky thing to do. <laughs> um, and yeah, as with many other of these methods such as flooding, um, oftentimes it will persist in the margins. So you're probably gonna wanna have a backup plan for any little patches that remain unburned. So uh, that leads us to the final method, which is shading. Um, so essentially the premise is you get some native, uh, some desirable vegetation established uh, until it's at least big enough and healthy enough to overtop the grass, it shades it out. It doesn't get the sunlight that it so desperately craves, and it eventually will just be outcompeted and die out. So, um, yeah, there has been a little bit of work uh, on shading as a cost effective long term solution, and my research uh, was hoping to build on that. So, for shading, uh, there's definitely some evidence out there that shows that. It's, uh, yeah, it can reduce seed germination quite dramatically, total darkness even to 0%. Um, when it is growing in those conditions, it will often reduce biomass, especially below ground biomass. Um, so reducing kind of energy stores and spread in the rhizome. And uh, yeah, one particularly influential study that was kind of the main inspiration for my work um, was one which live staked willows. Uh, and so the 60 centimeter densities, that was the densest treatment they had after two years, um, did reduce reed canary, uh, reed canary grass biomass by 68%. So uh, I've taken this graph from that paper. And uh, yeah, you can see the zero. So that was the control treatment where they didn't do any staking and then increasing density. So the denser they planted, the mass that was at two years. Um, and yeah, some of this work and, and similar work has been done with large shrubs and trees, but I haven't found any that has really tried it with um, smaller shrubs, uh, which may be more desirable in certain areas. 
So that was sort of the context for what led to our project. So um, we do have two study locations. Um, and so it started in Bear Creek. And uh, so that's a park in Surrey. And uh, they've got a hydroelectric right of way that kind of runs through the park. And so they have to keep this buffer zone about 60 meters wide all through the hydro line. Uh, and that area is, you know, they can't have any trees there um, growing up and potentially interfering with the hydro line. So this area is pretty open and it has been completely invaded with the canary grass. So in terms of acceptable species to plant there, it's really anything smaller than willows essentially. So shrubs and grasses and smaller things. Um, and then for Boundary Bay Regional Park in Delta, so that site is being managed by Metro Vancouver as kind of an old field habitat. So there are some trees in the site, but this particular large um, field, which is completely taken over by canary grass, um, they want to manage it in such a way that, uh, yeah, it doesn't rely on trees. So again, smaller vegetation, smaller shrubs and grasses and that sort of thing. So um, the Bear Creek site started in 2015. And for that experiment, we chose uh, hardhack, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with, a uh, uh, really nice native plant with uh, really bright kind of pink purple flowers. And uh, this was looking at density. So what is kind of the optimal, most effective um, planting density for hardhack? So whereas the willows kind of went up to 60 centimeters in that study, we took it all the way down to every 15, uh, 15 centimeters, which definitely gets quite dense. Um, and then the next year we started one uh, on species. So we wanted to test uh, how hard hat compared to red ozier dogwood and to thimbleberry as potential other contenders for, for some of these um, yeah, competitive shrubs. So just kind of a little schematic of what we did here. Um, so for the density trials, each block had uh, three plots, one for each treatment. So, and they were two and a half by two and a half meters. And then we just kind of sampled from the uh, inner square within that. So each of these dots basically represent uh, one live stake. So one plant that we put in there. And, and these are just kind of the different planting densities. And these were all with hard hacks. That's the plant there. And then the species trials, was that second experiment was same all standardized at 30, and then we just tested the different species. So we have the hard hack here, the red osier dogwood here, and the thimbleberry on the right. And the Boundary Bay site started in 2018-2019. Uh, and for that one, one of the experiments was another density replicate. So exactly the same uh, testing hard hack at different densities, but we just wanted to see if those results were true at another site as well. So you know, different growing conditions and whatnot. And experiment four. Uh, so that's the last one, uh, I promise. <laughs> that one was looking at different site preparation methods. Uh, and so, whereas before for the other sites, we had been using uh, a layer of wood chip as mulch, uh, we had a cardboard treatment that was looking at whether card mulch, uh, and then we also had an excavation treatment. So that one basically entailed bringing in an excavator and moving the, um, the top 20 centimeters of topsoil. And um, yeah, essentially the logic for that was kind of, um, yeah, removing all of the live plant matter and any of the seed bank that was in there. Sean, Sean I just wanted to say, I've turned off your camera because your, your sound was breaking out and, and without the camera, it should have a better chance. <laughs> okay, yeah, I wasn't sure I didn't notice that, but uh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so yeah, and uh, again, we have the, uh, the density trial replicate here. So same schematic. And then for the site preparation ones, we have the uh, hard hack with excavation, the hard hack with cardboard and the dogwood with cardboard. So the typical plot setup basically entailed going in with a rototiller. So that's this tractor attachment here, uh, which basically just kind of cuts up all the live plant matter and, and, and turns up all the soil um, to basically yeah, kill everything and make it kind of fresh for new planting. And then we would apply a, a 10 centimeter thick layer of wood chip mulch. Uh, and then we would basically, yeah, just take our live stakes of our shrubs and stick them right into the mulch, into the soil uh, and see what happened. So this is one of our plots at Bear Creek. So uh, that was the site in Surrey. 
about one year after planting. So you can see some of those uh, plants are starting to come up there they're starting to get some leaves. And then all of the grass that you see growing outside of the plots and pretty much everywhere is uh, more reed canary grass. This was uh, one of the sites at Boundary Bay during planting. So you can see that very fresh layer of wood chip mulch there. Uh, and you can see the live stakes, uh, which are brand new, but still dormant, uh, planted right into that. And, and then on the right, you see one of the excavation treatments. So that was the one that removed all the topsoil. And so all of our uh, plots were established at the start of the growing season and then sampled at the end of each growing season. And we collected all kinds of data, but uh, for the sake of my analysis and for the sake of this presentation, it mainly kind of focused on the percent cover of reed canary grass and shrubs, uh, the reed canary grass biomass and the shrub density. So essentially the live stem count. Uh, and so for cover, if uh, you guys aren't familiar with that, essentially it just means uh, if you imagine kind of looking top down and then seeing what kind of vegetation is there, uh, imagining all of the area of the ground that is obscured by, you know, one plant and its, its leaves and its stem and everything. So the higher the cover, the kind of the denser the growth of that plant. So it kind of tells you about its dominance. So uh, I'm just going to kind of jump into the results from all that here. I uh, won't bore you with all the statistics that led to it. Um, and so essentially all these graphs here, we've got the growing seasons after establishment. So either two, three, four, what have you, years after the establishment of that plot. Uh, and then we've got reed canary grass cover or what have you. Uh, and then for the legend here, uh, just to remind you, the, the numbers are the spacing. So hardhack 15 was like the, the really dense treatment for hardhack. So uh, you can see that, um, yeah, in Bear Creek and in its replicate study at Boundary Bay, uh, the overall reed canary grass cover does sort of gradually increase after treatment, but you can see it stayed much, much lower in the uh, hardhack 15 and the denser treatment than it did in the others. Um, and even all the treatments did stay lower overall than kind of the reference, uh, which most of the plots uh, outside were about 85% cover. Um, just so um, you can imagine what that would look like. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see that, uh, yeah, the Hard High 15 definitely performed quite well. And that was true both sites uh, and across both years or all the different years, I guess. And for the Reed Canary Gas Biomass, pretty much the same thing. So we can see that um, the 15 centimeter treatment is much lower for the biomass than both the Hard Hack 30 and the Hard Hack 50. Uh, and that was, again, true of both sites. Um, as well, uh, for the shrub cover, so uh, essentially how well the shrubs that we planted did, it's basically inverted, uh, but again, what you kind of would expect. So much higher numbers for cover in the hardhack 15 treatment. Um, and that, again, was true of both sites and across different years. And uh, so the live shrub density, so essentially the stem counts, the same thing. So uh, regardless of cover, more actual individual plants in, uh, in the denser treatment. And again, true of both sites. Uh, so experiment two, that was the one that looked at different uh, species. Uh, this one was kind of interesting. So uh, we've got the hardhack, the red osier dogwood, and the thimbleberry. Um, and it was interesting in that the first few years, there was really no significant difference between all of these species and how they performed. But uh, yeah, after like three or four growing seasons, for whatever reason, most of the thimbleberry really kind of just died off or was outcompeted. And you can see that the reed canary grass cover in those plots just took off once that happened and skyrocketed. Um, whereas both the hardhack and the red osier dogwood um, yeah, really kind of established well. The plants in those plots look super healthy. Um, so reed canary grass cover was very low in those plots. Uh, and same thing for biomass. So you can see it stayed really low for both of those species, but for thimbleberry after a few years, it just, yeah, took off. Uh, so 1500 grams per square meter, uh, as you can imagine, that's a fair bit of grass. Um, and so for shrub cover, uh, again, kind of the same thing, but the 
opposite. So uh, really good cover values for both the hard heck and the dogwood uh, in the last year, and then uh, very low for the thimbleberry, which again had mostly died. And, and same thing for shrubs, high numbers uh, of both the hard heck and dogwood, low numbers of thimbleberry. And the last experiment, uh, that was the cyprep method. Unfortunately, no significant results to report here. So we didn't really see a difference between the excavation, the cardboard, and the um, wood chip mulch. Um, but I mean, those plots are young. I think they are still being surveyed by um, my supervisors, other students. So who knows, maybe they will have some interesting results to report in coming years. So the main sort of takeaways from this, I would say um, don't use thimbleberry. It, is not great. Uh, as much as I love its berries, I would not use it for hard hack or uh, for <laughs> reed canary grass. But generally speaking, uh, you want to plant as dense as possible. And I would recommend using either hard hack or red or dogwood. Um, if you had to choose one, I guess I would go with hard hack just because uh, dogwood did not do quite as well at boundary bay. And yeah, this has definitely inspired a lot of areas for future work. Uh, I know we actually have some of the diploma students at BCIT tackling a couple of these things. Um, but yeah, one of them is this idea of critical height thresholds. So this is kind of just this idea of maybe there's a species that is in, in general a really good competitor, um, but it is just not, it doesn't grow tall enough to overtop reed canary grass. So is there a kind of critical height where those competitive outcomes dramatically shift? Um, and that was something we we're kind of hoping to test with thimbleberry. And so um, those results maybe do potentially suggest that that is what's going on, that uh, while thimbleberry does generally establish quite well, maybe it actually just wasn't tall enough in these plots and did eventually be outcompeted. Uh, and that's why it kind of took a few years for that to happen. Another is this idea of uh, even longer term monitoring. So many of the studies uh, doing similar work only did about two years maximum of monitoring. Whereas with ours, you can see that many of those experiments were now five, six growing seasons in. Uh, and even so results were still dynamic, results were still changing. So for example, you know, if we had only done two years of monitoring, we would have never seen all of that thimbleberry die off and we would have assumed that it probably worked well. Um, as well, well, testing other shrub species. So from uh, some of the research I did, these were kind of the four other species that emerged as good candidates. So common snowberry, salmonberry, Pacific nine bark, black twinberry, uh, all relatively common species around this area. I Many of you probably know quite well. Um, so these, I think, would all be pretty good uh, other shrub species to try. Um, and as well, well, also, it would be great to see an experiment go beyond just testing a, an individual species, but actually incorporate diversity in functional groups as a treatment. So if we standardize planting density, uh, for example, would a mix of all of these species work better than just a single one? Um, that I think would definitely have some interesting insights. Uh, and lastly, more work into below ground biomass. So the reason I didn't do this one is because just plain and simple, it is arduous and it would take forever. Uh, as you can imagine, taking samples apart and picking apart all the individual roots and rhizomes. Um, yeah, I, I think I am happy <laughs> with the way my project turned out and not including that. Um, probably would have led to me reevaluating some life choices. But uh, who knows, maybe some masochistic person would love to take that on in the future uh, because that would certainly yield some cool insights as well as to uh, kind of what goes on below ground for competition. So uh, yeah, that is all about reed canary gas. Thanks everyone. Well, that was um, a, another very fascinating thing. It's nice to have things that kind of relate to things that we've we've encountered ourselves. I've certainly, you know, heard talk about the problems with reed canary grass in Cyprus and other places. And the Burnett River, of course, is a place a lot of us have, have are familiar with for birding hikes and other other walks.